Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the second panel. Um, my name is um, uh, Regina Fiegel, and uh, I'm the head of the China Task Force in the Austrian Foreign Ministry. And um, yes, I'm looking very much forward uh, to our discussion um, in the uh, second panel. Um, what strategy, Eurasian connectivity, with the title Eurasian connectivity, what strategy, whose strategy? Yet. Um, yes, I'm uh, seeing some of the, I can already see some of the participants, but not all of them. Yes. Hello. Do you um, see us all now? Pardon? Do you see us all yes, now? Yes, uh, Romana, uh, Mario, yes. Um, yes, everybody. So hello, everybody. Um, let, us, uh, let us start. Uh, before we start, uh, I would like to give a short introduction uh, to our panel. Uh, very short, and then uh, I will uh, hand over to you uh, for your uh, presentations. Um, first, a few uh, remarks. Um, China is increasingly uh, becoming uh, the EU's uh, biggest uh, geopolitical rival. Uh, and at the same time, as we have heard before, it uh, is an important partner uh, for us. Um, we will therefore need uh, a stronger EU-China uh, policy with a more structured institutional uh, response and uh, a more realistic framework. Um, and uh, we have to, to respond uh, in a more, uh, we have to give more structured uh, institutional responses. Uh, to China's state-driven investment uh, strategies, uh, for instance, uh, to BRI or to Made in China 2025, and um, and uh, with a stronger over with with an overall stronger geostrategic thinking uh, to China's uh, global ambitions, and connectivity uh, is an important aspect in this respect. Um, BRI uh, is a, uh, has become a synonym uh, for China's desire to play a global role. It goes certainly uh, far beyond uh, infrastructure investment um, and uh, with a strong geopolitical component um, and uh, investments in strategic infrastructure for both trade and military uses. Um, BRI has uh, both uh, ha has received both praise uh, and criticism. Um, where uh, the main points uh, of criticism are low uh, transparency of projects, lack of uh, reciprocity in market access, um, uh, little added value for businesses uh, in the host countries, unhealthy dependencies and excessive uh, indebtedness in project uh, countries. Um, for instance, in Pakistan, uh, Sri Lanka or Montenegro. Where does BRI currently stand uh, in terms of its development uh, three years after the first Belt and Road Forum in Beijing? Does BRI represent an uh, opportunity uh, for much needed uh, infrastructure investment in Europe and beyond? Um, also, for instance, in the Western Balkans, or is it more of a risk for us? Um, how is BRI seen today uh, by the countries uh, participating in the 17 plus one grouping? Um, in September 2018, uh, the EU presented uh, its policy re response to BRI, the EU-Asia Connectivity Strategy, um, as an alternative uh, to BRI. Um, where, do, where do we stand today uh, with the implementations after, three, after two years? Um, is the EU connectivity policy a realistic alternative 
uh, to PRIs, uh, to China's, uh, uh, to, PR, to the PRIs China-centric approach. Also in the context uh, of the broader geostrategic setting uh, of the Indo-Pacific, uh, or is it more of a paper tiger? <laughs> um, what about the financing uh, of the project um, so that we can really implement it? Okay, I will stop here. Um, and um, I would now like uh, uh, to um, present uh, our distinguished uh, panelists. Um, it's a very interesting group. Um, let me start uh, with uh, Ambassador Janes Premoge, um, uh, who I know from Beijing. We served together there, and uh, I'm also very happy uh, to cooperate with you again uh, in this conference, Ambassador. Um, you are um, a, a career diplomat uh, with the Slovenian uh, Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Uh, currently, uh, you are head of department for Africa, the Middle East, uh, Asia, and Ocea Ocean. I can't say it. <laughs> Oceanian. <laughs> he has, uh, um, Ambassador Premose has a broad experience uh, on um, Asia uh, with uh, several ambassadorial postings uh, um, in the region. For instance, uh, in China, uh, that was your last posting before you went back to Slovenia, but also in Japan, in the Republic of Korea, uh, Bangladesh, or India. And uh, you were also a uh, national coordinator for the stability pact uh, for South uh, Eastern Europe. You have done much more. I have to say I was very impressed when I read uh, your CV this morning, but I will stop here. Um, our second uh, uh, panelist uh, is uh, uh, Romana uh, Vlahutin. Uh, we also know each other. We met uh, last year uh, in Brussels uh, at the conference uh, of the uh, um, WIIW and the uh, Austrian uh, Central Bank, uh, ÖNB, um, on European uh, connectivity. And I'm very happy to see you again. Um, Romana is uh, ambassador at large for connectivity at the European uh, External Action Service. She's also a career diplomat. Uh, before joining uh, the Croatian Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1999, um, she worked as an analyst uh, uh, for the Bassioni uh, UN Commission for former Yugoslavia. Uh, the UN Tribunal in The Hague and the Council on Foreign Relations in Washington, D.C. And as a Croatian diplomat, uh, she served in Washington, Belgrade uh, and the Kosovo. And uh, from uh, 2010 to 2014, she was a uh, foreign policy advisor to the president of uh, uh, Croatia, and uh, most recently uh, she was posted as the EU ambassador to Albania. Um, Peter Hefele um, is uh, our third panelist, uh, is uh, director uh, uh, of the team Asia and the Pacific uh, at the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Berlin. His uh, main fields of uh, expertise are economic policy, transformational policy, international development cooperation, and energy and climate policy. He's an expert in, uh, on political, economic, and social developments in Asia and China. He also worked um, as a director of the China office of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Shanghai and as a director of the regional project Energy Security and Climate Change in Hong Kong. Um, finally, um, our fourth panelist is uh, Mario Holzner. Uh, he is executive uh, director of the Vienna Institute uh, for International Economic Studies in Vienna. Um, uh, I would like to mention here that uh, 
uh, WIIW ranks uh, among the globally best uh, think tanks uh, for economic policy. Um, um, so uh, the think tank is really one of the best uh, worldwide. Um, and uh, in uh, Mario is working uh, inter alien on issues uh, of infrastructure investment in greater Europe. Uh, and he proposed uh, a model um, for a European Silk Road. Um, he's lecturing applied econometrics uh, at the University of Vienna and uh, has experience in both uh, the banking and the media sectors. Um, so we have a very interesting group of uh, panelists today uh, to talk about uh, Eurasian um, uh, connectivity and uh, it's really great to have you all with us and uh, I would now uh, like to give uh, the floor uh, to um, Ambassador uh, Premose. Um, Please, sir, could you start uh, with your topic? Uh, just to remind you, uh, you all have uh, a maximum of uh, seven minutes each, approximately, for your statements. And uh, yes, I'm very much looking forward. Please, Ambassador. The well, floor is yours. Thanks. Um, Regina, I hope we hear each other to start with the technicalities. Yes, I can hear you very well. Can you also hear me? Sure, absolutely. Now, okay. first of all, really, Regina, it's wonderful to see you. And I hoped very much that we could meet in person, but uh, let's leave that for some other time. And uh, luckily today we are without our usual attire, which is masks. Now, coming back to the subject. First of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to be a member of this panel. I think this conference comes in a very important juncture of time and events that we've been following in the past couple of, I'd say, years in relations between the EU as well as China and the China's position in a, in a global world. I have to say that, uh, not to waste my time, but I have to say that I'm looking with a great interest to see the results of a couple of the exercises which are ongoing on in Brussels with relations to China. The first of all is an exercise scrutinizing the terms of the reciprocity and the responses and aspirations from different uh, member countries uh, as for that. And the second exercise, which I believe uh, started last week in Quasi Work Group in Brussels is a mapping exercise in order to form a kind of the toolbox with which in the future we could tackle the problems and all the, solve our ambitions that we may have or harbor with uh, as for the relations with China. We hope that both of the exercises will bring in the inputs which would give us the impetus let's say, to work on with China in the next uh, foreseen period. Now, we have seen and we have heard from the first part of the panel, there were some important messages. And uh, I should not hesitate to underline that basically the unity of the member states is the crucial one when we speak about China. And we should look at it from each and every aspect, not only the trade and relations, the IPRs, the trade and the, the other facilities that the China has been uh, offering uh, to us within the past decade, let's say so. Um, only united, and I believe that and on one hand, I believe the team spirit of the uh, homes back in Beijing demonstrates that it's there should we should basically approach China and with its might of economic engine as well as the size. Now, my part of the discussion should be a contribution to the China and CE countries, uh, namely the Balkans, the Belt and Road Initiative, as well as the 17 plus one. Um, let me just remind you of the two facts which I believe are known to all of us who've been dealing with China. 
that the Belt and Road Initiative, originally One Belt, One Road, uh, conceived back in 12 and 12, um, was, came about as the extreme depositive message in the aftermath of the financial crisis in 2008 and resonated in the world. Well, during the past one year, we haven't seen much activities basically on the European front, less that for Central Asian countries as well as uh, for the South Asia, Southeast Asian countries where they are targeting them, I believe, uh, pretty actively. But Belt and Road Initiative is being handled by NDRC, a very powerful a political extension of a development body of, of China, and therefore it has a certain priorities. While to a contrast of that, the 17 plus one uh, initiative is being handled by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The Secretariat is still being housed by the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, and they may have their own, however limited agenda might be when they this is being compared to the Belt and Road Initiative. And now, of course, the China with its uh, economic might and it's conducting, as one of the distinguished panelists said before, in a pattern-based diplomacy to targeting the countries where the regional diplomacy is being directed towards the developing countries. And that Namely, in terms of the regional uh, coverage, I would uh, say that this might be, in a sense, not well suited for the EU member states. And namely, countries which they come from the Balkan, Balkan region. Well, speaking about the Balkan region, of course, there is no doubt about the region, region's considerable need for investment as well as the infrastructure, and then the credit-based offers from China. But of course, should not, should not neglect all the pitfalls which we have seen um, as a practical example from other countries, namely, I believe, the, the South Asia. Um, so there should be a certain division as for those countries should and could benefit and have the access to the EU financial instruments and to seek and acquire the capital and investments from the more transparent sources than from the Chinese ones. Well, consequently, I would say as uh, to, to offer the thought that the Chinese investments in those uh, 12 EU member states, which participate in 17 plus one, uh, remain in terms of volume, uh, very modest, about one tenth or 10% 10 of the total Chinese investment elsewhere in Europe. And we have seen under the circumstances, we have seen a considerable, I would say, pause in a sense of uh, activities in, in that. Well, as Martin has said from the previous uh, panel, we can see that those EU states do share a sense of disillusion about the ambitious plans as they were set forth at the beginning of this exercise or initiative 17 plus one. And there is a well-documented mismatch between its economic promises and the ultimate outcomes. Now, in the absence of those significant economic stakes as they have been expected, many of those CEE countries have been of course open to sacrifice relations with Beijing for the other objectives. I do believe myself that this is the state of play as we are seeing it right now. Then, as for the other aspects, which are very much in the news these days, um, in order to protect their own infrastructures, many of those countries have signed the G5 uh, agreements with the United States. And that's also a fact. Now, coming to 
the, the idea of the connectivity. Well, I've been following that since even before I went to Beijing with a great interest because I see it as a great countermeasure against the Belt and Road Initiative and our initiative in which we should build our platforms together. And of course, there are still outcomes to be seen from that connectivity. Hopefully, when we restart sometime next year with the scrutinization of our relations with China, I believe this would then be an input to develop a, a new relationship, not only the safeguards, but also the promising parts for uh, EU as a whole, and as well as for those countries in, in those Balkan states which are aspirator, aspirators or candidates for the EU accession. Now, absolute attention should be paid to the visibility of the EU then as a major partner for development by strengthening its public communication. And then EU supported projects on connectivity. Um, there should be a tailor-made regional programs, for instance, for students. I mean, we all know that connectivity is not related only to the hardware, to the infrastructure, the railroads, but also to the digital connectivity, people's to people's exchange and so forth and so forth. The last leg, I would say, people's to people's exchange has seen a great development in those years which preceded the coronavirus uh, period in which we live in right now. Now, let me say that on a part of our country, that the Slovenia, we stand convinced that we can only better connect with Asia, China, and the other countries through the EU. Therefore, we absolutely stand very positive in supporting the, the projects which may emerge from the connectivity um, platform. That special attention absolutely has to be uh, paid to. Then there is one more project which would be, I think, important for um, also having full impact on the connectivity platform. This is the conclusion, hopeful conclusion of the strategic investment agreement, which in a sense has been envisaged uh, to, to happen uh, by the end of this year. This will give uh, absolutely a new impetus. Well, um, Reinhardt from the former panel has mentioned that the connectivity could also or should also be extended to Africa in a sense uh, to give us a leverage over the Chinese investments there. Well, I would certainly be extremely supportive of that idea, but at the same time, I'm given a thought that we should explore the platform of connectivity to other Asian countries, primarily to Japan, because with the FDA agreement in place, we can see much larger benefit. And secondly, also, of course, uh, to the Korea, not, not to mention India, perhaps, and, and the other countries in the south of Asia. Now, that the, the last, my last remark, because uh, I believe I'm already exceeding my time, is how should the EU deal with the Western Balkan countries? Those member countries, I believe that we have the um, standing rules, which are transparent and very, uh, so there is, uh, they are in place, uh, basically there is no doubt about that. For the other countries, let me give us a bit of a local flavor from my Beijing time. Um, I have to say that I attended a couple of those meetings of the local coordinators of uh, 17 plus one. And I have to say that EU delegation has scrutinized every single draft and every single paper which came out as the outcome of those uh, working meetings. And I believe that that's the, the very powerful tool 
um, not to adhere to that divide and conquer uh, strategy. And I believe that EU should have a leading hand in that and see what the practicalities are. In terms of the plans for the infrastructure, in terms of the plans for the Chinese investments in the, in the region and so forth. Well, connectivity is an incredibly wide platform and it offers many of the uh, opportunities which can be explored and worked on. So later on, let me conclude here, but uh, later on, I'd be more than happy to, to offer my whatever, however modest uh, comments might be uh, to contribute to the successful conclusion of that panel. Thank you very much, Virginia. Um, uh, thank you, Janis, uh, uh, for your contribution, uh, which has been uh, very interesting. Um, I also agree, uh, we need, you, you said at the beginning uh, that we need uh, uh, that, that the unity uh, among the member states uh, is crucial uh, when we are dealing with China. I can only agree. I think that uh, um, in recent months that uh, we are seeing more coherence because uh, the member states, uh, they know that uh, if they want uh, to sort of, in order to, 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 to face uh, the China challenge, we do need to speak with one voice, otherwise uh, we can't uh, succeed. And I think what is good now is that uh, China is, uh, uh, for a year now, has been discussed uh, at all institutional levels uh, in the EU. And uh, I think that was uh, is one reason why uh, we have more, we, we are seeing more coherence right now. Um, Yes, um, may, may I uh, thank you very much, Janis, uh, again. I'm sure we are getting back to you uh, later on. Um, may I give the word now uh, to, uh, to the next, uh, uh, next uh, panelist, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, Romana. Um, and I uh, suppose you, you, you will talk uh, about the, what the EU is doing uh, in, uh, to, uh, in the field, in the area of connectivity. Um, Romana, the word uh, is yours. Thanks a lot and uh, many greetings to, to my beloved Central Europe from, from Brussels. Uh, very happy to be with you even so virtually. Unfortunately, could not do it in Vienna. Um, it's a very comprehensive topic and uh, I will give you uh, uh, an idea of where we are and, and what are we thinking about and what are we working on at the moment. I also hope there will be time uh, later on to really discuss and engage with the, uh, with the audience, which we can't see unfortunately, but uh, I think that's always the most important and interesting part. What I will try to do is to give you some sound bites. Uh, and, and, and try to cover um, the most important elements of what we are talking about here uh, today. And also, um, I will try as much as possible uh, not to talk about China, but to talk about the European Union and what European Union is doing in, in understanding and, and working on the connectivity as such. Um, I firmly believe that um, even if there was no uh, so Chinese Belt and Road and, and, and the significant uh, connectivity strategies from others, uh, European Union would need to look into connectivity as an issue because the digital um, revolution has brought a uh, level of interdependence uh, between um, all of us and, and the sectors that we work on that is um, so much changing the politics and geopolitics that we need to understand uh, the new context that we have found ourselves in. Uh, but China saw this first and they saw an opportunity in this massive need for new infrastructure in the world. They came in very early and they started uh, building their prominence through, through Belt and Road, understanding also the geopolitical consequences of investment in critical infrastructure. Um, I think now this is sort of um, something that everybody understands that investment in infrastructure uh, not only defines 
uh, the corridors and value chains and sort of regulates um, very much uh, the trade, but it's also uh, something that has a very significant rule of law dimension. Connectivity is not value neutral. Connectivity comes with norms and standards. And by building concrete infrastructure, you at the very same time bring in um, your understanding of, of values and norms and standards that uh, ought to be there. Um, it also creates interdependencies that have many, many challenges. They have benefits, but they have many challenges. And, and I think the, the discussion on the digital uh, infrastructure and digital connectivity is just the best example of uh, the kind of questions that come with these interdependencies. Uh, European Union um, has come up with its uh, connectivity strategy in, in 2018, uh, but I would argue that 2018 was a long time ago. And I think in terms of what has changed in the meantime, it is also a moment for us to look at the document that we have and see how we can, um, how we can make it really fit uh, for purpose of our, of our times. Um, European Union, uh, in order to exercise its capacity as a, as a global power, it uh, needs to really make good use of its many advantages. Um, the first one, and I don't think it should be underestimated, European Union itself is a product of connectivity. So um, in a way, we are probably world champions in understanding how to handle uh, these interdependencies. We have found many fantastic software solutions for overcoming the differences and being interoperable. Um, and this is a knowledge that is very valid and, and very much sought after by many regions uh, in the world. We can talk about that later. Second, uh, we have absolutely highly competitive industries. I'm very happy to see that um, uh, Nokia and Ericsson are uh, increasingly becoming um, a partner of choice for, for many in the world, not only in Europe. Uh, and I think we need to um, make everything to sort of bring this competitiveness um, even more um, out there. Then we do have financial means. Uh, one of the first things that I looked into when, when I started working on the strategy was money. And uh, it's, it's fascinating comparison that in the same period of time as Belt and Road, European Union, which means institutions and, and its member states, have basically provided around 350 billion euros in development assistance uh, and China has provided around five or promised to provide around 500 billion in, in, uh, in loans. Uh, and finally, we have political capital, which also should not be, should not be underestimated. Uh, we are now at the moment of a, of a great standoff between US and China, and there are very many countries in the world that do not want to become a collateral damage of this standoff. So there are, there are very many uh, partners who are coming our way and asking for much more European presence when it comes to connectivity. Uh, and finally, the COVID has uh, created um, an interesting new opportunity for us uh, because the rebuilding after COVID and investment after COVID uh, will, uh, will give us an, an opportunity to build back better. And I think we need to, to pause a bit and see how to do this in the best, uh, in the best possible way. Uh, the needs for infrastructure in the world are massive. Uh, world Bank estimates uh, around 2.5 trillion a year. Nobody has this money and there is no public money that can cater for this. So one of the, of the key tasks we have is to how to incentivize private investment, how to crowd in private capital, how to be innovative in doing this. And I, I think Mario might have something to say later on about it, but it's really, um, it's, it's key. 
um, at the moment on, on the European capital markets only, there are around 30 trillion euros of, um, of more or less, I would not say idle capital, but capital that can be, that can be used for this as well, at least a, a portion of it. Um, it's, it's interesting also, for example, I was quite, uh, I mean, it's, it's a fa fascinating pieces of news that we got from Japan and, and China, that Japan decided to be carbon neutral by 2050, China by 2060. Um, European, um, European industries are very competitive when it comes to the green transition. So I think this is also an opportunity that we will need to, to use. In terms of our connectivity strategy, uh, we have been uh, looking at uh, connecting Europe and Asia uh, space, uh, and it turned out that besides this need to see how much and what has changed from 2018 to now and how we best cater for this change, uh, it's also an understanding that um, connectivity uh, needs to be looked into, into sort of a much, much uh, uh, greater uh, geographical uh, span and, and definitely discussions on uh, looking at connectivity with Africa are already going on and we are trying to uh, also in a way map uh, together with our partners of course uh, what are the key corridors what are the key vectors if you wish of investment in uh, in different geographies in the, in the world um, but the key, uh, the key element here, and you mentioned it, and, and Ambassador uh, Primoz, you mentioned it, is um, unity. I call it co coherent approach. I call it focus. Um, I call it creating a scale. Uh, because in order to really bring change with connectivity policy, you need to have a scale. And European Union can have this scale only if we are all together. Uh, this scale brings uh, the strengths and it brings visibility that is very, very much needed. We are at an important juncture now because there are discussions on MFF. There are discussions on programming, which means that we are now planning for all different uh, uh, programs that will be um, worked on in different regions. And we are also uh, sort of looking at the post-COVID uh, recovery elements. Uh, and this is something that um, will give us, I hope very soon also the ideas uh, on, on where do we move next with the implementation of the strategy in terms of very concrete projects, because um, I think the best way to, to also promote your uh, interests and values, your norms and standards is to very concrete projects on the ground. Um, an important element of this are partnerships. It's an integral part of our strategy, uh, the idea to partner with other like-minded uh, countries. We have already concluded the partnership with Japan. We can talk about it uh, later. There are at the moment discussions on the ministerial statement on connectivity with ASEAN, as an extremely important uh, uh, region for European Union. We have had some um, interesting and exciting discussions with India. Uh, it is not, um, I mean, it's, it's a very comprehensive um, discussion before us, but uh, India definitely uh, wants to, uh, has reached out and wants to work with us in connectivity. And also, uh, basically, wherever we go or whoever we talk to, there is always one plea for European Union to come with an offer that is uh, at a scale and um, uh, that comes with sort of a speed that is needed for those countries to, to really be able to catch up in terms of, of infrastructure. It is, it is critical because the digital industry, you know, it's creating incredible opportunity for less developed, but also if they lag behind, they will lag behind uh, a lot. So I think we, we should not waste this moment. We should uh, look at it um, 
in, in a sort of uh, cool-headed strategic uh, way and define our priorities, identify our flagships, uh, and work together in, in implementing them. Uh, again, I'll try to, to stop here. Uh, as I said, just giving you some, some sound bites, um, and we'll be very happy to answer any question that might come later on. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Romana, uh, for your interesting contribution. Um, it's, uh, you said uh, uh, that the need for infrastructure investments are massive and, uh, that, uh, and that it's now necessary to think uh, of uh, uh, means or how can we bring in new private capital. As you mentioned correctly, Mario will later on uh, talk about uh, this topic extensively and um, well and uh, you also said uh, that now the budgetary planning is going on in the EU that gives uh, the frame uh, for implementation of concrete projects uh, I'm really um, that is another very interesting point so I'm re I really wonder how much money do we have now on the plate? Uh, uh, as far as I know, the, the new um, multi-annual financial framework uh, um, uh, was decided. Uh, um, uh, oh, we do have a decision already. And uh, I'm wondering uh, how much money uh, can we now already see how much money will be at our, um, will be there for connectivity projects. Uh, what is also promising uh, is that uh, you, is the fact that uh, that uh, you are now talking, or at the EU, the EU is talking uh, already uh, with like-minded uh, partners, and that these talks are very promising. Um, for instance, uh, Japan, uh, all of ASEAN or India. Um, that is really a very important uh, step, uh, and it's good that uh, that uh, uh, that the EU has started uh, discussions uh, with uh, those partner countries. Um, that brings me uh, to the next uh, panelist, uh, uh, Mr. Hefele, uh, Peter Hefele. You are, you will be talking uh, about uh, um, uh, EU or EU connectivity and the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, uh, concept, uh, uh, and uh, you will uh, you will sort of uh, um, uh, give uh, you will you will you will ask if those two are. Uh, if EU connectivity and the Indo-Pacific uh, concept are complementary strategies. Um, okay, I'll give the word to you. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Friedrich. Thank you very much also to the organizers, to FZ and IFRI, and of course my dear colleagues in the KS office, when it's a great opportunity. Well, China has become indeed a major and centerpiece in our domestic and international work, and in recent years, it's indeed the other partners in the Indo-Pacific region, which we deal with and how to compete to strengthen our stand against China. And it is against this experience in our work that I will reflect on the position of the BRI and the connectivity strategy in a broader and emerging geostrategic setting of the, what now has been called indeed the Indo-Pacific strategy. So as you mentioned, Regina, it is indeed looking into the common strategy and the common approaches of these uh, elements, uh, whether to ask, is there a complementary uh, strategy? Is it coherent or is it another buzzword? And we had many in recent years if it comes to the strategic thinking. Well, as, has, as it has been mentioned in the first session, uh, the BRI is indeed uh, the first comprehensive and geostrategic strategy by the PRC. Since the Mao era, I would say it's indeed a new type of major power relations as Xi Jinping has uh, acknowledged this. And it is indeed, let us decide that BRI is a very flexible concept if it comes to semantics as well as to the instruments and approaches. It's still the concept uh, uh, focusing very much on the Eurasian landscape. And I let aside the, the Russian concept, for example, of the Eurasian Economic Union 
but it's indeed China primarily, which is knocking at the doors of Europe and you might decide whether from inside or outside. Well, at least luckily it has led, I think, to a sometimes very painfully and slow progress of the renaissance of a geostrategic thinking in Europe. I think for many decades, uh, Europeans have thought that they are already in another era, in an era where these major power relations are outdated or has been transformed into a new relationship. But, well, new types of power relations have come up, but not necessarily to that, uh, what is according to our taste. Europe, to a large extent, we must acknowledge, has been put and pushed into these new discussions. And if I look to the Indo-Pacific region, these, these nations really started way earlier in reformulating their national strategies. They had acknowledged that there are tectonic shifts around which shake the current uh, national and world system. It's the discussions in Japan, in Australia, and not at least in the US. Luckily, and I hope not too late, uh, the German and the French government have re released some new guidelines on the Indo-Pacific with some widely shared views, but also interesting differences. And I assume indeed, Romana, I think that the EU will soon follow with its own strategic concepts. Um, these new documents, I think, are really a new type of a comprehensive strategic re response to, global's, uh, to China's global ambitions. It is, of course, still kept into this, what I would like to call the holy trinity of partner, competi competitor, and strategic rivalry. But I think it's indeed contains, and we must be frank about it, it contains a momentum of hedging and even containing China's new power through building new alliances. And this is something which lies at the core, I think, of the new Indo-Pacific concepts. Uh, these documents indeed reflect a remarkable shift in the perception of China. This has often been mentioned before, but I think we should clearly define what is different to many other attempts which have been made in recent years. And I think there are some fundamental assumptions of these concepts, which I would like to lay out at three objects I think we have. It's first of all, the engagement has to be measured, and not only with China, by the way, whether they are compatible with the upholding of a rule-based and a multilateral order. I'm not sure whether the BRI will serve to this uh, end. Um, I think rather that the EU, for example, should build upon, and this has been mentioned through existing and emerging mechanisms, such for example, as the free trade agreements with many of these like-minded countries in Asia Pacific, we have to make use of this and raising European leverage uh, in its restoring, expanding, and in strengthening its multilateral institutions. And as, has been, as it has been mentioned, there's a desperate need for alternatives to China's offer among all the nations in Eurasia and in all fields of politics. I think the often discredited European model is really still vital, and it is one of the most accepted blueprints globally. We have to indeed, and literally speaking, cement uh, our footprint. That means investing in infrastructure, but it's still the soft power which remains indispensable. And if we look to China's instruments, for example, China has re really uh, acknowledged that these instruments, soft power instruments are really helpful. They have integrated this into their foreign policy instruments. It has often been mentioned that we have to have the a principle of common but differentiated responsibility. That is the key expression which we had used in the Paris, Paris Climate Agreement. But I think this could also be a kind of guideline for European approaches. Um, it's often demanded that we have to be united, but I think uh, Europe's strength lies not just in a uniform, homogeneous approach. It's the diversity, it's the strength of its different capabilities, different traditions, different lines of communications, which makes a real difference. So what that this really means, if it comes to very concrete policy steps, um, I think we have to, of course, be clear regarding our interests, and these have to be based upon values. But we have to acknowledge that there are a lot of other nations out there which, who, which do not share our values, basically, but they can play an important role 
in achieving common goals. And I think this is what we now call the more flexible concept of partnership. This has to be based, of course, on common markets approaches of acceptance of rule of laws and reciprocity in all these bi and multilateral relations. But this is something uh, Roman has mentioned that this is not only true for China, this goes to other relations and we should indeed not be too occupied with China. There are a lot of other things out there in nations which we have to think about. We have to indeed improve the management of Europeans' performance and appearance, but I think it's unity in diversity. This is a competitive advantage of Europe as long as it is, of course, based upon robustness, coherence, and rule-based issues. And uh, if I come to the regions mentioned, for example, in ASEAN, we have to foster self-cooperation among these nations and regions. We would way go, go beyond our capacities to supplement and uh, to create own structures there. We would overstretch our capacity, but we can help these nations to build better corporations, and then we could link into these efforts. So with these some remarks, I would like to finish my contribution. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Peter. Um, um, uh, for um, your elaborations on the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, concept. Uh, um, and uh, um, I will now give the floor, uh, we will dis discuss it, uh, we will touch upon it later in the discussion. Um, and um, I would now like to give the floor um, uh, to Mario, um, who will talk uh, about um, financing uh, of uh, possible financing uh, of European uh, connectivity. Uh, you have suggested uh, some time ago uh, uh, to uh, create uh, as an answer to BRI a European Silk Road. And uh, yes, I'm uh, looking forward uh, to your to hearing, uh, we're all looking forward uh, to hearing uh, your uh, suggestions sir, in this respect. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Regina. Uh, uh, thank you for having me on this uh, uh, distinguished panel. I have prepared a few slides now. I wonder whether I can share uh, my screen or whether the uh, moderator, the host, is um, uploading my slides. Otherwise, um, mm. I can. That's a good question. Um, also do it, I guess, also without the slides. Uh, maybe uh, you could do it uh, yeah. uh, without okay. the slides. Yeah. Hmm. Um, let me uh, uh, say that the Vienna Institute for National Economic Studies typically does um, traditional research uh, uh, projects and, and, and research papers, almost boring with a lot of numbers and, you know, uh, but we are also a think tank, so every now and then we will have to uh, come up with also a uh, out of the box idea, uh, a blue sky uh, proposal. And two years ago, we indeed uh, made such a proposal of a European Silk Road. Um, and the idea was basically that you have, if you if you uh, think about the uh, map of Europe, uh, even wider Europe, including uh, the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. A region, then you have uh, a, a continent uh, of roughly a billion uh, inhabitants and half a billion in the West, uh, having quite a good life and about uh, the same number in the East uh, with about only half of the income uh, uh, available. And that means also only half of the productivity, roughly speaking. Um, it is interesting to note that if you think about the same map of wider Europe, um, then modern infrastructure would be similarly developed uh, in the West. And if you think about motorways, for instance, almost no uh, modern highways uh, in the East at all. And now uh, there are good uh, empirical uh, uh, and, but also theoretical reasons to believe that actually infrastructure investment can help to develop also economically uh, uh, regions which are not doing that well. Um, uh, uh, it's true um, uh, 
probably it works both ways. Rich countries can afford better infrastructure, but uh, as I said before, it is also going the other way uh, uh, that also poor countries, if they invest into infrastructure, they can develop because basically what infrastructure connectivity in the broad sense uh, does is to reduce the costs of producing in your country relatively to the others. Um, it is also true that the European Union has been doing a lot uh, in uh, regarding, for instance, transport infrastructure. However, um, these are little steps here and there uh, under the umbrella of the transport uh, uh, section of trans-European networks. Uh, there has been a slow expansion of these networks, corridors since the early 1990s. Uh, there are funds available, but as I said, it's typically for some uh, 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 small and slow expansions of these, um, of these corridors. And at the same time, uh, we have been speaking about it already several times, uh, China comes uh, uh, historically more recently with its Belt and Road Initiative, the new Silk Road. Um, at least nominally, there are huge funds available for this. And, uh, uh, and indeed, actually, China is also investing quite a bit of it. Um, and now, uh, given all of that, uh, we came up with a proposal of a European Silk Road. Um, uh, connecting basically the industrial centers of Western Europe with the populous but less uh, productive and with less income uh, uh, areas in, in the east of wider Europe. And uh, we have suggested two tentative routes, uh, one starting uh, in, 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 in France, uh, in the core segment, going through the Benelux countries, um, uh, Berlin, Warsaw, Minsk, all the way to Moscow, and with extensions, possible extensions uh, to Lisbon in the southwest and then uh, uh, Russian Kazakh border in the east, and another um, uh, uh, route going through northern Italy, southern Germany, the Danube Valley, with connections via the Black Sea uh, to, to southern Caucasus, southern Russia. Uh, the idea would be to have. Um, uh, both a, a modern highway system with, uh, prepared for e-mobility, for autonomous driving, uh, and as well as a high-speed uh, rail network with, with uh, speed uh, of travel of uh, above 300 kilometers per hour, so that you basically could connect uh, Paris, Berlin uh, below four hours travel time, uh, and a string of uh, additional um, uh, 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 ports and 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 logistic uh, hubs and what have you. Um, we uh, then uh, calculated uh, a uh, uh, the costs of this uh, approximately eleven thousand kilometers land routes. Um, uh, very conservative calculations, so we assumed very high costs of about one thousand billion euros, one trillion. This is a lot of money. However, if you relate it to the EU's GDP, it's only about 7%. And if, again, you assume construction costs over 10, 20 years, uh, this becomes uh, rather, uh, uh, well, uh, not nothing, but, but uh, relatively speaking, not that much money. Also, given uh, that we mentioned that money is really available on the markets, it's not like we lack uh, money uh, as, uh, uh, as uh, economies. Um, we calculated an, uh, a lot of uh, economic effects on, on GDP, on jobs, on exports. Um, I won't go into the details of this. I would say that uh, such a big project would not only have uh, huge economic advantages, but it would also in the long run help us to um, define common infrastructure standards, for instance, also in e-mobility, but uh, even more so uh, have more political personal cultural cooperation in a larger Europe. And I think it would uh, offer something like a new narrative uh, for this uh, continent. We have uh, been discussing also uh, ways to, uh, uh, for how to operationally and, and financially uh, actually do this um, um, infrastructure investment. 
Um, I won't go into the details. Uh, the suggestion is, is broadly speaking, an own company which would, which would issue bonds which could be backed uh, by uh, something we call a European Sovereign Wealth Fund, which would invest similarly to Norway's Sovereign Wealth Fund, and where at least in the beginning, maybe uh, Euro area countries uh, with uh, uh, um, uh, the profits from the European Central Bank uh, could act as guarantors uh, for, for these bonds, and, and uh, then uh, that would be the basis for financing this, but there are a number of other possibilities, obviously, via the European Investment Bank, via the FC, and, and, and many other possibilities. We can discuss certainly also um, ways how the private sector can, can be crowded in. And just uh, a last word, uh, as an epilogue, we had um, uh, a presentation in Brussels, Regina uh, was mentioning it already, um, also together with uh, Ramona on the panel. There were also uh, colleagues from uh, from DG Move from Bruegel, uh, and uh, I think it was uh, very successful. Next day, uh, there was an editorial in the Financial Times uh, taking up and in, in support uh, of our project um, uh, of our suggestion of this European Silk Road. Uh, and uh, so I think also in, in many other media uh, and uh, we, we entered the discussion in Europe and we had uh, uh, a uh, follow-up uh, uh, publication with uh, a French and a German institute this year and we are planning um, uh, further research on, 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 on ways uh, uh, how to actually uh, practically uh, um, uh, do something about such a huge infrastructure uh, together with uh, colleagues from the Central European University. Uh, these uh, things will be published next year. So I would like to stop uh, here, but I have also a number of things to say about uh, what uh, the other colleagues at the panel uh, have been talking about. So maybe we can do this in the discussion mm -hmm. later on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mario. I, I think I have to say that I really like uh, your suggestion uh, that we need uh, um, uh, we need to invest much more in uh, European infrastructure uh, to connect uh, uh, European cities and ports, um, and maybe also beyond. Uh, when I think of uh, my time in China, uh, I remember that. Uh, the Chinese uh, railway uh, network also with uh, high speed trains is absolutely fantastic and uh, I think that uh, that there is a, a, a big need in Europe uh, to have a, a, a modern uh, and more efficient uh, infrastructure network it uh, would also help probably to uh, uh, the economy uh, to recover uh, in Europe after the uh, post-COVID uh, uh, crisis uh, that we are having right now. Um, um, yes, um, uh, would uh, any, uh, would any, uh, does any of the uh, panelists uh, wish to respond to uh, what uh, has been said uh, um, uh, by our, um, right now uh, in, in um, yeah, do you wish to respond uh, to the yes. uh, statements? Yes, I just have a question. I think there is a lot of, uh, you know, convergence of, of, of ideas and, and minds here on the panel. Uh, but I just want to check with you. I, I have been reading some questions in the meantime that have been yes. sent by a chat. Would yes. you like to answer those as well? Yes. Okay. Um... I read them already. Maybe I can yes, start. Yes. Uh, I, 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 uh, which one would you suggest, uh, Romana? I have one question actually, which is uh, for you uh, uh, to answer. Um, um, uh, one, um, the audience. Uh, one person in the audience uh, asks, uh, where does the notion and wording uh, of connectivity? Uh, come from uh, on the EU side, uh, or um, where do we find uh, the root and the uh, origin of the EU connectivity uh, strategy? Um, I can just sum up. Uh, uh, there are a number of very interesting questions there. Um, first, I mean, there is a major difference. And the problem with the word connectivity a bit is that it means many things to many people. 
uh, there is no sort of one one defined uh, agreement on what it what this is, but uh, there's a clear distinction between uh, connectivity and connectness in a way. So not building a bridge or a highway immediately means that you're engaged in connectivity. Connectivity is a systemic a systemic approach to to critical infrastructure. Uh, and the interdependencies it creates and the, the political um, and economic um, uh, results that it brings. Um, and, and this brings me to, to the one question that was put there, whether EU wants, in terms of digital, wants to be a normative power of a or a market power. I think you can't be a normative power if you're not a market power. And I think, um, these two things are absolutely linked. There are, you know, the, the two sides of the same coin, uh, and, and this is something where we we want to go to and what we want to support. Uh, there was a question about Africa. There is absolutely no doubt that in terms of digital, um, there is a need um, uh, on both sides. I would say an interest on both sides for for Europe to go in uh, with with its offer. Um, I was in India a year ago. I was absolutely fascinated by by um, by something that I heard at, at one conference. Um, India, given its population and the average age of twenty five, uh, is is producing more data than U.S. and China together. So you can imagine what does it mean for the for the industry today. Uh, so there are very many opportunities out there and we need to, to look at them strategically. Um, there was a question about um, the US. I think yes. it's an important question. Um, United States um, has been approaching us on connectivity for, for, um, for, for many months. Uh, and we have been looking into different um, options. They came up with this idea of blue dot network, uh, sort of standardization of, um, of, uh, of principles of quality infrastructure. But US has already earmarked 60 billion US dollars through its Build Act uh, as a guarantee facility for the uh, support of the private investment in infrastructure. Um, and um, there is uh, there is a quite a lot um, going on there, um, and and definitely we, we talk to the US. We will see um, also uh, whichever administration will be after um, after the elections. But um, connectivity is not going anywhere, and connectivity uh, by definition requires partnerships. So I think this is something that will also help us. Uh, come back to the discussion, a meaningful discussion on, on multilateralism and that, you know, agreeing on, on common rules uh, is a question of common sense. Thank you very much, Romana. Um, I think that uh, Janis uh, wants to, uh, uh, or, or P Peter Hevele, who wants to be first? Uh, Maybe Janis was the first to raise his hand. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, well, of course, there were many different aspects uh, to the same subject, but uh, let me just offer my two cents worth to the question about the possibility of cooperation between the EU Asia Connectivity Program, Belt and Road Initiative from China. Well, thanks a lot for to Romana for all the insights and also the background uh, facts of all this, but uh, even with the development that we are seeing today is uh, important to scrutinize the wish lists of the both sides. Basically, if China could be within the platform of the Belt and Road Initiative or 17 plus one, then the European side and member countries as well as the candidate countries should basically stood together to identify the practicalities and the risks on, on, on both sides. I believe that one standing example that uh, we are seeing, that is the extension of the railroad between the Budapest and the Belgrade, which has stalled for many, many reasons, can be a standing example on how other projects should be built and what kind of the resources uh, should be used, as Mario has explained to into us, uh, small detail. Um, that I believe is uh, 
the only way, negotiating, sitting together, exchanging, and then being patient about the Chinese way of transparency. Thank you. Um, I just would like to follow up to Romana's remark and go to the ground work, so to say. If I look, for example, into Central Asia, there's plenty of European initiatives, national initiatives, but they are not very well coordinated. These countries really ask, who shall we, who shall we ask to get an answer on the European side? Um, I think it's an advantage to have this diversified range of instruments and institutions out there, but um, I see a real lack of coordination really on the ground and the Commission and the European Central Service could serve, but there's plenty of non-state actors as well, ranging from the Chambers of Commerce, for example, to institutions like us. I think there's much need and we could bring much more leverage on the ground uh, if we could better coordinate in this respect. Mario. Uh, yes, so let me uh, reflect on, on, on a few things that have been mentioned before. Um, Jan has mentioned that the, the, um, the Chinese uh, funds in the, re in the 17 plus 1 region are rather modest compared, uh, for instance, to, to European uh, funds, which is true. But if we, if we narrow it down maybe to the Western Balkans, then actually uh, the uh, Chinese uh, activities are uh, to a certain extent comparable uh, in size uh, to at least with regard to infrastructure proper uh, with regard to uh, European activities. And in both cases, it's, it's a lot of loans. It is true the Europeans have in addition also a grant component, but it so at least so far is not a huge uh, part of, of the funds available. So I think if uh, Europe would step up uh, the grant component, if it would be also quicker in, in uh, delivering, because that is something that is an advantage of the Chinese, that they can be uh, fairly quick in, 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 in their uh, financial support for, for infrastructure investment in the region, I think that would uh, help us a lot um, in, in a region where Europe uh, wants to be actually uh, the only game in town. Uh, uh, so I think we can do something about it uh, in the Western Balkans. And uh, regarding uh, Romana's uh, uh, important issue on, on, the, on crowding in private uh, uh, capital in, in connectivity projects, I think, the, uh, and also mentioning that actually there is huge amount of money out there. It, it's not like uh, we lack money, it is there, but the trouble is that the private sector is uh, at, in, in, in this crisis that we are in, in a way already since some 20 years, um, is extremely risk averse. And uh, we can see it. the private sector is ready to pay the public sector uh, to, uh, to keep uh, its money uh, in, 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 in in government bonds, uh, so this is remarkable. Uh, uh, we, uh, if we want the private sector to to crowd in, we need to maybe uh, give some guarantees to the public sector needs to take over some of the risks that the private sector perceives. So, I think some kind of uh, uh, risk sharing programs uh, would be important. Uh, in order to have this public and private partnership in, in investments. Otherwise, uh, it is really the private sector that has to, uh, to push uh, for, for more connectivity projects. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mario. Does uh, any of the panelists want to answer one more question uh, uh, from the audience? Uh, um, if not, uh, I would suggest uh, that we are having a short uh, final uh, round. And uh, may I uh, ask all the panelists to, um, to conclude uh, uh, with uh, one or two uh, um, main uh, messages uh, on your side, uh, beginning with uh, Janis. 
Thank you very much, Regina. That is a, my final message would be, when we speak about China, we speak about one sixth of the population of this planet. When looking at the, what you have mentioned, the progress which has been made in China in the past 30 years is unprecedented in the modern history of the world. And I myself, I'm very much interested in, in the social aspects of that society, how the young Chinese will perceive their own role in the world and so forth. Meaning that the, that brings me to a conclusion that not to say that 21st century belongs to the Han people, but we need to find a dialogue which would reason with the Asian values and the Chinese way of doing things. And that means an intensive dialogue. And uh, that I believe is those exercises, which I have mentioned both on the reciprocity as well as the, the connectivity issues uh, within ASEAN and so forth, should bring us closer to that transparent dialogue with China. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yanis. Um, Komana. I can't hear you. Sorry. I said it's not easy, it's not easy to come up with one sentence, but uh, what I want to, to, to go away with is that um, connectivity for, for sure is going to be with us for a long time, and it's definitely going to be one of the key concepts of the 21st century. And I firmly believe that European Union has all the capacities to be one of the, the leading global powers in connectivity. Um, I also believe that thinking about this and finding solutions for this can be or can bring a, a bit of a transformative uh, uh, value to, to uh, European Union as, uh, as uh, sort of self-confident power on the global stage. Thank you. Thank you. Peter? Well, first of all, I think we should really make use of this full range of instruments, insights we have at hand. It's a unique basket, a treasure we have not exploited so far. And the second is, uh, well, with the European Green Deal, we have set a very ambitious transformative framework. I think we should not simply copy Chinese approaches. I think this is our new model, which is widely observed. It has to be filled. Um, but it gives us the opportunity to set new standards and be attractive for many nations which are in dire need of a transformation by themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Give the floor to Mario. Thanks a lot. Um, I would maybe like to pick up a, a sentence that Romana uh, had in her uh, initial statement, uh, not to talk so much about what China is actually doing, but actually to think what what Europe could do. Uh, so in that sense, we should not necessarily al always think in, in, in what can we do against China. It could be even things where we might cooperate or not, but what we can do in order to uh, uh, prosper ourselves and connect ourselves better. And also, as Peter said, I think the European Green Deal is a, an excellent uh, 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 and unique uh, uh, piece of, of policy, but that has really to come to life and we have to do something about it. For instance, in terms of connectivity also, as you, Regina said, uh, everyone who has been in China traveling with a high-speed rail uh, uh, was fascinated. And I think this is, a this is a fairly old technology. We could have done this uh, a long time ago ourselves. Uh, and in that sense, I think, at least in this case, we could also learn something from China mm -hmm. and, and, and try to realize uh, this kind of, of projects, which could also help us to reduce uh, CO2 and reduce uh, uh, air travel quite a lot. So I think that would be mm -hmm. a, a positive project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think that this was, uh, this, uh, those were very uh, positive uh, uh, closing remarks uh, uh, for Europe. And uh, maybe uh, we have to be grateful uh, to China for being such a challenge because China really makes us think and uh, makes us work and uh, think of uh, alternatives and means how to reform ourselves so that we get better at the end of the day. Um, 
Right. Uh, I, I think I uh, thank you very much uh, to all panelists for uh, your really excellent uh, contributions. Uh, I think it has been a very interesting discussion. And um, I would now uh, like uh, to give the floor um, uh, to uh, Dietma um, to, uh, for some final uh, remarks uh, and uh, to this conference. Thank you. Where is Dietma? Thank, thank you very much. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank once again our partners who have made this possible, but first and foremost to thank really the panelists and the two moderators who did such an excellent job in, in steering us through these three hours. I do not intend really to sum up this extremely rich discussion, which I think <clears throat> brought in a lot, uh, a lot of diversity, but one thing which struck me and which was mentioned both in the first and the second panel uh, was the extent to which we really see unity in the way forward and in, in the thinking uh, of how to confront the challenge of China, which I think was not there one or two years ago. And it's well noted that uh, unity does not mean uniformity. And as was mentioned by one of the panelists, there is also strength in our diversity as long as we are able to challenge it, to channel it in, in the right direction. Uh, one thing which I found uh, interesting was that um, the first panel, I think, had a lot of community in thinking in terms of uh, the European Union no longer being naive, uh, of having to defend its interests in standing up for its values, uh, but also in pointing out that uh, we are in for the long haul and it would be also naive to think that uh, we can count on regime change in, in any sense, uh, sort of providing us with a China, which might be easier to deal with and more amenable maybe to, to the way we see the challenges of the 21st century. So in that respect, I think it showed that we have come to a more common thinking on, on how we need to deal with that. But at the same time, I also sense at this stage, there is still a slightly defensive attitude. Whereas I think in the second panel, uh, there was more in it on, on, on how to move forward, uh, both in terms of stating very clearly, as Janis did, that um, we have to take China as a reality in the 21st century, but maybe the Belt and Road also offers one of the areas where we can engage in a dialogue. And the other thing which came out very clearly, I think, in all the contributions is that this is also an area which we should not necessarily deal with by only focusing on China or responding to China's Belt and Road, but where we have the unique opportunity to build on a concept which we think some of us, Romana mentioned that, was created in the European Union, uh, stands at the very basis of the European Union, and where we have the opportunity to work with other partners and look into a more forward-leaning uh, strategy. Uh, combining the two, I think, will be basically the essence of the challenge which we face when dealing not only with Asia, but also increasingly taking in uh, the concept of the Indo-Pacific, which uh, is a new one uh, based on a, a German-French paper, which uh, Mr. Hefele rightly said, will sort of merge in a new European strategy. I'm not so sure whether we should deal with it only in the context of hedging and containment. I think it, it also offers an opportunity not necessarily to confront China, but to diversify our interests and bringing in other partners. And this is, I think, one thing, one element which has been lacking we were so obsessed with China, I think, in the recent past that we forgot about you know, the opportunities of dealing with all our other partners. With that, I once again thank all of you. Uh, it's been a great three hours, a lot of input, a lot of uh, thinking, which I think will, will help us uh, in the way forward. And as I mentioned in my opening remarks, 
uh, we still have some, some important uh, venues uh, bringing in the 27 to deal with China in their own internal context and providing for unity, but also then uh, hopefully catching up with the summits we lacked physically and which cannot replaced, uh, be replaced by virtual calls. Thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we'll see each other again physically in more uh, benign circumstances uh, in the near future.